is Pete Beeney. Uh, I've been working at Spotify now for over five years. Um, in that time, as you might imagine, I've seen a great deal of change, um, both within our company with regards to its growth, but also some pretty big changes in the industry at large, some of which I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, so what we're going to be discussing over the next 20 minutes really is um, looking at what removing the screen or removing visual stimulus might mean for the advertising industry and what are the sorts of skill sets that are going to be required for brands to be able to effectively communicate when a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say crutches, but where when a, a lot of the elements which they've spent years and years and years perfecting uh, are no longer uh, at, their, at, at their behest to, to be able to manipulate. Um, and there's obviously some big challenges that come in working in a, in a screenless world or in a, in a world which is, is bereft of, of visual stimulus. Um, so we, we wanted to keep things a little bit practical as well today to talk about what should be brand, brands potentially be thinking about as they move into um, screenless interfaces uh, and in particular voice. So to begin with, I wanted to take everybody through um, the industry that we're in, so recorded music. Um, so the, the recorded music market is currently experiencing a pretty major shift um, after over, over a decade of continuous decline. Uh, revenues have just begun to creep back into growth, uh, and that's owed in no small part to the streaming model and its effect on music, distri or on music distribution, um, and, and obviously the revenues inherent in that. Um, so you can see on this chart that from the IFPI uh, that streaming now makes up the highest source of recorded music revenue in the world. Um, and you can see that the change from moving from the ownership model to the access model has been pretty marked. Um, it didn't take long. So from, you know, Spotify actually launched in the Nordics just over 10 years ago, but really we haven't had, you know, mass coverage across most of the major music markets of the world for any longer than five or six years. Um, and in that time, there's been a, a big, big shift in the way that the consumer um, interacts with music. Uh, and according to Nielsen, Streaming had a high point of 7.5 billion weekly on-demand audio streams in March of this year. Um, and it's the first time the figure had ever topped 7 billion, setting a new record. And obviously, we expect to see that shift and accelerate even further. Uh, and in addition, on-demand audio has been streamed over 184 billion times this year, which is a 62.4% increase on the previous year. Um, now, if we look at that just in terms of the UK, um, this is actually Spotify's free, um, the free side of Spotify's business, um, which obviously is, is, is a major part of our, you know, of the freemium model. It's been growing very, very steadily since Q4 2014, um, up until now, well, from when we started using Comscore to be able to judge who is visiting us from a, from a free user perspective. But the growth is, you know, has been significant um, as the music listeners' preferences shifted from the ownership model to the access model. Uh, and as you might expect, a lot of the music listening uh, on our app is going on in the background. Um, so that's either background on the app on somebody's desktop or with the phone in their pocket. Um, and if we look beyond just the music industry itself, um, you know, there, there, is, there are other um, environments in which the rise of streaming is going to have an impact. Um, so obviously audio has been a huge part of the car, um, you know, since really since the invention of the radio, or in, 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 since at least a radio was installed into the dashboard of a car. Um, and, uh, but the connected car we think is gonna make a big, big shift um, in terms of the ability to actually reach those, those listeners in, in an environment which is more or less perfect for, for the music listener. Um, so we were looking at a recent study by KPMG estimated over 220 million connected automobiles will be on the world's roads by 2020. Um, and in that connected car report, the survey responses showed that streaming music for in-car use was the number one desired feature relating to the purchase of a connected car. But even before then, the large use of Spotify in cars through technology that is already highly distributed um, specifically through Bluetooth and also through aux cables on older models, um, has led us to begin testing our own driving mode feature. So 
in Spotify, we use data to determine anything that we're actually going to develop in our product suite. So we don't tend to look into the development of new elements for the product's UX unless we feel that um, there's enough usage to warrant it. And, uh, and we passed that threshold in the car quite some time ago. Um, and that's just the context of the, the, the car itself. Um, but there are also different, uh, there are going to be other environments which I think are probably overlooked even now. So if we think about the now, um, the workplace is one of the biggest um, areas for content consumption on Spotify. And if you can see it through a lot of the uh, playlists that we actually create ourselves. So when we put our content team onto playlists, it tends to be because we have analyzed data of uh, keywords, you know, key terms that people are using when they actually title their own playlists. And we found that focus and study um, were very, very much over indexing when it came to people's consumption patterns. Um, and that is a big, big swathe of somebody's workday. So if you think about it, your average consumers, if they're employed, are probably going to be sitting behind their desk for at least seven hours a day, or at least in front of their computer for seven hours a day. And that's an environment which isn't necessarily conducive to consuming video, which is, as you know, it's the de facto content type which most brands are currently creating. Um, so as we move on to uh, that non-visual environment, there's a lot of challenges for brands. Um, and I think it's probably summed up quite well by um, this clip, which you may have already seen by a, a friend of Spotify's, Scott Galloway at NYU Stern. Probably in our view, the most revolutionary and is gonna shake brands to their core, voice. Voice technology is getting tremendous traction. Alexa is in 4% of US households. Siri handles over 2 billion commands a week, and 20% of Google searches on Android handsets are input by voice. Who loses? Brands. Voice-based ordering eliminates the need for packaging, design, and end caps, all the things brands have poured billions and decades into perfecting. The decline of brand began with the advent of Google, and every day fewer people Put a prefix of a brand name in a Google search, and the same is going to happen with voice commands. Our research reveals that over the past year, non-branded product searches have increased in every CPG category. Prediction, the decline is going to accelerate. The death of brand is here, and it has a voice, specifically Alexa. Buy batteries. Amazon's choice for batteries is Amazon Basics, AA batteries, 48 pack. It's $13.60 total, including tax. Would you like to buy it? No. I also found 20 pack of Amazon Basics AAA Performance Alkaline Batteries. It's $7.61 total, including tax. Would you like to buy it? No. That's all I can find for batteries right now. All right. Check your Alexa app for more options. So there's nothing that unusual about a retailer taking advantage of their custody of the consumer to trade them off to a private label brand, which is what Amazon is doing here. Because when you go on the site, in fact, you do find that Alexa has more options. There are several branded batteries. It's just Alexa, without having to bother with the consumer seeing a brand or packaging, has decided to omit or let other brands just disappear from your selection set. So that's just one element of what can happen, obviously, if brands um, aren't necessarily careful when it comes to uh, their distribution channels. Um, you know, the, he's absolutely right. There is uh, nothing new about retailers being able to um, understand the fact that they have the custody of the consumer and that they are able to um, to create a preference for their own brands, uh, much to the benefit of themselves. Um, but that, you know, that, that is going to cause some pretty big issues, I think, going forward if things like Alexa and Google Home do manage to gain a lot of traction, which, I mean, if we look at, from our perspective, um, probably the, f the fastest growing um, sort of third party uh, peripheral for Spotify listening is actually currently Alexa in terms of the speed of growth from launch to now. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the in-home in is a huge element for Spotify. Um, in-home listening extends the time that we have with the consumer uh, a great deal. 
and it makes sense um, to interact with it through voice. You know, voice is up to four times a quicker than actually typing into an interface what you'd want. So if, if you're sitting in the in-home environment, it makes perfect sense that you would want to speak to your in-home speaker to determine your music choice. Um, <coughs> so that means that obviously not just will audio be important if we think about it in terms of the, you know, being inside the car or in the home or in the workplace where you aren't necessarily gonna be able to be reached by a visual medium, but now the consumer is able to actually um, interact through audio as well, through voice. Um, and, uh, you know, if that becomes the medium of choice for interaction, uh, then that means that, you know, the environment for there being a screenless place where people are able to gain information or entertainment will only grow as these technologies advance. Um, and, you know, we've, we've seen a big, big shift in that ourselves. Um, as a company, uh, you know, streams are increasing very, very rapidly when it comes to, you know, people's consumption on actual mobile devices and also on connected devices. So 63% of Spotify's global streams are now coming through the mobile phone. Uh, and that shift away from necessarily the desktop being the, you know, the, the standard way of consuming music on our platform um, is accelerating at, at quite a rapid pace. Um, but that, I think, is a good thing for brands to some extent because there's only so much time that a consumer can be looking at anything. Um, you know, it isn't necessarily about Spotify being necessarily brilliant um, as a platform in terms of being able to have all of this time with our consumers. It's just a natural part of, uh, it's the nature of the beast, really. If you think about it, you know, there are going to be plenty of in moments in your life where you need your eyes for something other than the consumption of content. You know, you need to, behind the wheel, keep yourself alive <laughs> when you cross the street. Also keep yourself alive. Um, you know, when it comes to actually studying and focusing, uh, you really can't have visual stimulus. It's going to be interruptive to, um, you know, to, to whatever it is that you're trying to focus on at the time. So, so this just extends the amount of time that brands have as a potential to, to, um, to communicate with their audiences. And as audio moves away from the traditional model of, um, you know, of, of one to many, um, the move towards streaming is gonna mean that it becomes much more intimate, much more of a one-to-one -one communication. Um, so whether it be through you know, the, the consumption of, of media through, uh, through streaming services like our own, or through you know, voice-enabled smart speakers, uh, there does need to be a, sh a shift to some extent in the way that brands start to think about their use of audio. Um, and we also need to do a lot of development in that regard as well, you know, to, to evolve uh, the platform so that the advertising messages seem, um, you know, they are seamless uh, and that the consumer is able to intu intuitively interact um, in the right context. Uh, so it becomes less intrusive and more relevant to the consumption that's currently already happening. So we've started to make those changes across our ad stack and you'll be seeing a lot of development um, over the coming months uh, in that regard. Um, but also, you know, we need to start thinking about telling a story across all those devices and telling a story to an individual consumer who's going to be in a lot of different mind states and be able to be reached by a platform like our own or our competitors for that matter throughout a day. Um, because there's almost no time in a day where a consumer isn't gonna be able to consume music because again, they're not encumbered by having to pay attention with their eyes to something. Um, and for brands, uh, you know, we know how effective, obviously, that branding in a visual way can be. Um, that's been perfected over, you know, decades and decades and decades, um, both of television advertising and of digital advertising. Um, but the advent of ad blockers and ad-free subscription platforms, uh, there is an industry shift towards advertising being less intuitive. Um, and native advertising promises to open the door to a future for better advertising for brands, for publishers, and consumers alike, whereby giving the reader or viewer a choice to consume or not to consume. Um, and as the way of native or visual ads are constructed with a headline, a brand logo, uh, accompanying image, accompanying video, um, the same type of thinking will need to apply to audio because many of those visual cues uh, that brands have been relying on for years 
won't exist. Um, and brand advertising is namely about making associations. Um, you know, everybody in this room lives and breathes the art of persuasion uh, and the science behind creating these associations in the mind of the consumer. Um, and we just wanted to pick out one, you know, really good example of a brand that's done this over the years. Um, probably not the sexiest of brands, but McDonald's have arguably been one of the most successful brands in terms of brand building and visual storytelling. They've been very, very successful across almost every medium. Um, you know, and this is just obviously a, a quick blast of some of the work that they've done just in out of home that's been effective. But actually what's interesting too is that they set themselves up quite well for the future um, through actually being one of the few brands in this day and age that still bothers to, to engage in sonic branding. Um, so you'll all likely be familiar with this. So in a whistle um, with absolutely no visual stimulus, I would, I would guess that everybody in this room would know that, that that's McDonald's that would be speaking to them. Um, so where does this leave uh, the future for brands? Well, you know, this, this is obviously, it, it holds a real, you know, a great deal of opportunity for brands to be able to communicate in this environment. Um, and in some, in, in some ways, it's about being able to marry some of the new technology and the ability to have that one-on-one -on -one communication with the consumer. Um, with some of the things that perhaps brands have forgotten, like sonic branding. Um, so just, to, just for a little bit of interaction, um, just uh, I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play out a few little pieces of sonic branding and see who in the room, just shout it out. I don't actually need to see a hand. Just scream it out, somebody, if you recognize any of these. Intel, so lots of people got that one. T-Mobile, I heard somebody got it. Well done. Yep, yeah, there's at least one gamer in this room. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there, you know, there is still a lot to be thought about. They, you know, they, there are going to be a whole generation now of young people growing up in households with the likes of Google Home, with the likes of Alexa, um, who are going to have a great deal of associations with brands, but also going to have a lot of interactions with brands that aren't necessarily going to be visual in nature. Um, and they are going to be interacting with the internet at large through voice to some degree. Um, so. That got us thinking about, well, what are practical things that brands can start to think about when it comes to a world where the, a great deal of the consumption that's going on, certainly from insofar as music is, is, is happening, again, in a screenless environment, but then also where uh, their communication with the internet at large is also being done through a voice interface. So the first, obviously, we've been through is apply sonic branding. Um, you know, this is, this is obviously one of the simple ones and it is something that some brands do better than others, but it does at least provide that thread of something audible, which at the, you know, if you're lacking something visually or in an environment where somebody can't actually see the, any of the brand's assets, they're still able to, to recognize who it is that's speaking to them. Um, we also think that it's important to maintain a consistent voice. Uh, does anyone know who this is by any chance? His name is Jake Wood. He was an actor in East Enders um, and was actually on Strictly Come Dancing last year. Um, sad that I know that. Um, but uh, yeah, so Jake Wood is actually surprisingly more famous in America, even though Americans wouldn't know it, because for 10 years he was the voice of the Geico Gecko, um, which is a, a very uh, famous embodiment of a brand in terms of US television advertising. Um, but what was very interesting that we found was that actually there was a huge furore. I mean, this is a, a number of tweets when um, poor Jake Wood's agent uh, failed in his negotiations with Geico to renew his contract. But the interesting thing was that the internet at large got very frustrated and annoyed by the fact that Jake Wood, just the voice of the Geico Gecko, was no longer the voice of the Geico Gecko. So it just goes to show the actual power of voice and the power that a voice can have especially when it's consistently used across the brand. So we would say that thinking about the tone of voice and also the voice talent itself with, that, that represents the brand is important to be consistent 
for a long period of time. Um, the other is something that we never actually see is audio as a section of brand guidelines. You never see audio integrated into brand gu guidelines, or very, very rarely is audio integrated into brand guidelines. And we think that actually taking that, that small step in the, you know, when it comes to identifying or you know, a, a brand is, is very, very important because it, you know, much like you would have your visual guidelines for any brand, these are the brand visual guidelines for Renault, it's just as important that brands moving into this new, these new screenless environments are also able to have a consistent use of the audio, not just of the visual. Um, another thing is to adapt to that one-to-one -one element. I mean, being you know, digital platforms actually provide a great deal of opportunity in this respect. Um, you know, adaptive audio is something that we're experimenting with at the moment. The first campaign that we ran uh, along these lines was actually with Deliveroo. Um, we ran this in the UK this summer, um, and it had the potential to serve over 46,000 different creative combinations. So there were a huge number of different ways in which the copy could be created based on a number of different data inputs. So this could be location, time of day, day of the week, local restaurant supply. Um, and that was really about being able to make sure that the the advertising message was relevant to each individual user rather than necessarily trying to do what radio has done in the past, which is to be able to speak to very, very different demographics and very, very different segments of society all with the same piece of copy. Um, and then the last, uh, the last example that we'll leave you with is, is just something subtle that Ford did with us again over the summer. Um, for the launch of the uh, Ford Kuga. And this was very interesting because it was looking at a lot of these different data points, but subtly weaving them into the creative. So um, I, I'll play this. Afternoon jog to your Spotify playlist. That's got Ford Kuga. But how Kuga are you really? An angry wasp. It's never just one, is it? Are you sweating marmalade? Lucky girl, they must have run out of buzz. Looks like you're ultra cougar for now. The new all action forward cougar. How cougar are you? So if you would have listened to that, that actually was one of 12 different creatives that were served to different, um, I suppose, sub, sub segments of Ford's actual audience. So we were able to look into Ford's um, own segmentation and be able to look at the potential audience for the Kuga. Now, in the case of the audio that you just heard, that was their creative team um, working on a brief that was for specifically women between the ages of uh, 35 and 44, who we found um, through being able to look at that segmentation on our actual platform, were uh, very much over-indexing on exercise and running, and they served that content to that audience only when they were running. So when we knew through um, the time on the platform giving us an indication that this was a regular occurrence, but also through the playlist itself being keywords that relate to running. And as you notice as well, they were able to weave in um, the fact that the voiceover, you know, even though all you're hearing is panting, so not the actual copy voiceover, but the person who's running to the playlist was a female voice because that was obviously meant creatively to reflect that, uh, the, uh, that the brand understood the moment in which that consumer was consuming the content as well as what their gender was. Um, so these are just a few ways that, that brands should be thinking about their work uh, in the non-visual world. Um, I hope that proved to be some degree of food for thought for everyone in this room. Um, and I think we have a minute or two for questions. Um, I think there's some mics doing the rounds if anyone has a question. Nope. Well, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>